Hello, and welcome to this presentation, Understanding Pulse Width Modulation. In this presentation, we'll provide a short technical introduction to pulse width modulation, some of the most common applications of pulse width modulation, and how pulse width modulation is measured and analyzed. Let's start by talking about a common task, controlling the amount of power delivered to a load. This is useful in many cases. For example, if we want to control the speed of a DC motor, change the brightness of an LED, etc. One approach is to use a potentiometer or other type of variable resistance to reduce the voltage at the load. But there are numerous issues when using a variable resistance in this way. First, and perhaps most importantly, this is inefficient, since this dissipates or wastes power in the form of heat. And this heat can in turn create other issues. Because they must dissipate power, often for long periods of time, Variable resistances tend to be physically large. In addition, mechanical control is typically required for many variable resistances, making it difficult to quickly or precisely control the voltage or power. Instead of varying the voltage, we could instead control power by turning the voltage on and off, that is, by providing voltage in the form of pulses. Unlike the previous example, in which the voltage was raised or lowered, here, the amplitude or height of this pulsed voltage remains constant. We can change the average voltage by changing the width of these pulses, or the percentage of time the voltage is on. Longer on time means more power delivered, and shorter on time means less power delivered. This process of changing the width of a pulsed voltage is referred to as pulse width modulation. Pulse width modulation is very common in a wide variety of applications. We'll provide an overview later in this presentation. It's primarily used to control the amount of power delivered to a device, but in some cases it can be used to convey information or to control slash configure a device. Pulse width modulation has many advantages, including low power loss compared to variable resistances, as well as the ability to be controlled digitally or programmatically. Pulse width modulation is relatively straightforward with two main parameters, the duty cycle, which is by far the most important, and the switching frequency. Let's look at each one of these in a little bit more detail. Duty cycle is the percentage of time that the signal is on. For example, a signal with a 20% duty cycle is on 20% of the time. A 50% duty cycle means the signal is on half of the time, and a signal with an 80% duty cycle is on 80% of the time. Duty cycle is the key parameter in pulse width modulation because the duty cycle is chosen, or varied, in order to control the amount of power delivered to the load or to change the behavior of the load. The duty cycle can be set or controlled in three main ways. One method is manual control, such as a knob or slider used to dim a light. Another method is automatically, such as an output voltage feedback loop in a switched mode power supply. And the third method is programmatically, that is by means of some intelligence that varies pulse width based on some external logic or parameter. Pulse width modulation is often used to control power by changing the average voltage level seen at the load. The average voltage is simply the peak voltage times the duty cycle. For example, if we have an 80% duty cycle and a peak voltage of 5 volts, the average voltage will be 5 times 0 0.8 or 4 volts. A 50% duty cycle would yield an average voltage of 2.5 volts, and decreasing the duty cycle to only 20% would decrease the average voltage to only 1 volt. As can be seen here, lowering the duty cycle lowers the average voltage and vice versa. The other pulse width modulation parameter is the switching frequency, which can be defined as the reciprocal of the time between the rising edges of the voltage pulses. The necessary switching frequency depends on the load or on the application, with frequency ranging from the tens of hertz all the way into the high kilohertz range. Generally speaking, applications that require faster or more granular control will require higher switching frequencies. But note that in most applications, the switching frequency is fixed at a certain value. Note that the example waveforms shown on the right both have the same duty cycle 
of 50%, but have different switching frequencies, the waveform on the bottom having a switching frequency that is twice that of the waveform above it. Now let's take a brief look at common applications that use pulse width modulation, namely visual devices, audio devices, switch mode power supplies, DC motor control, servo control, DC to AC inverters, and battery chargers. There are many other applications, but in the interest of time, we'll limit ourselves to these examples. Pulse width modulation can be used to control visual devices in two ways by changing intensity or brightness, and or by changing the color. For example, the brightness of a display or monitor is often controlled using pulse width modulation to vary the intensity of the backlight. In this application, higher switching frequencies are generally desirable because higher switching frequencies reduce visible flicker, especially at lower brightness levels. In addition to controlling the brightness, the color of some LED packages can also be controlled using pulse width modulation. In this case, the intensity of three individual LEDs are used together to produce the desired color. Pulse width modulation is also used in some audio applications. The pulsed input signal is low pass filtered, and this effectively performs a digital to analog conversion. The analog output voltage is a function of the input signal's duty cycle. The advantage of this approach is that pulse width modulation can use Class D amplifiers, which are either on or off, and are therefore much more efficient than so-called linear amplifiers. As a result, pulse width modulation-based audio uses less energy and produces less heat than using traditional analog amplifiers, and this is particularly helpful in the case of handheld or battery-powered devices such as smartphones. Pulse width modulation is also at the heart of modern switching or switch mode power supplies that work by chopping DC into pulses. The switch is usually a MOSFET or other type of power semiconductor, and in this example, the switching is controlled by a pulse width modulated signal at the MOSFET gate. The supply output voltage is regulated by comparing the output voltage to a reference voltage, and then varying the duty cycle of the pulse width modulated signal. A higher duty cycle will increase the output voltage, and a lower duty cycle will decrease the output voltage. Another very common use of pulse width modulation is controlling DC motors. For example, changing the speed of a fan in a computer case, or the speed of a vehicle's fuel pump. In some cases, the speed of the motor is a function of the average voltage, which in turn is a function of the duty cycle of the pulse width modulated signal. But in other cases, such as in many computer fans, the supply voltage is held constant, and a separate pulse width modulated signal is used to control the speed. In both cases, a lower duty cycle produces a lower rotational speed, and a higher duty cycle produces a higher speed. Note that even though pulse width modulation means that power is not supplied continuously to the motor, the motor's inertia can provide torque and keep the motor spinning, even during the off portion of the cycle. A special case of DC motor control is servo control. Instead of controlling speed, as in the DC motors we just looked at, here pulse width is used to control the position of the servo. The pulse widths indicate the offsets from the servo's neutral or zero degree position. For example, pulses with this width are used to place the servo in the neutral position but pulses with this width are used to rotate the servo 150 degrees. It's important to keep in mind that in most modern implementations, the width alone, not the duty cycle, is used to control the servo position. Servo power is provided over a separate, that is non-pulse width modulated, constant voltage connection. DC to AC inverters also make use of pulse width modulation. In a pulse width modulation based inverter, Duty cycle is varied in a sinusoidal fashion, and this pulse signal is then low pass filtered to produce a smooth AC output signal. This is similar to our previous example of audio signals. And similar to our previous example of switch mode power supplies, the output voltage can be held steady under changing load conditions by monitoring the output voltage and adjusting the duty cycle as necessary. 
This ability to provide a steady output in the face of different load conditions makes inverters based on pulse width modulation technology superior to conventional DC to AC inverters. Another power related application of pulse width modulation is battery chargers or charge controllers. And this is particularly common when charging from solar panels. There are two general requirements when charging batteries. The first is to prevent overcharging as this can damage the battery. The second is to ensure the correct direction of current flow. When charging a battery, the charging voltage must be reduced as the battery approaches capacity. But if the charging voltage were to become less than the battery voltage, current could flow out of the battery instead of into the battery. Both of these requirements can, however, easily be met with pulse width modulation. The controller simply produces pulses with the widths necessary to create the desired average voltage. Testing or analyzing pulse width modulation is usually performed using an oscilloscope and appropriate voltage probes. In some cases, analysis of pulse width modulated signals may require more than one scope channel, either in the case where we want to look at multiple pulse width modulated signals simultaneously, or if we want to look at both a pulse width modulated signal and a related analog signal at the same time. The basic measurement parameters of pulse width modulated signals such as duty cycle and frequency, are relatively easy to measure with an oscilloscope, either manually using cursors or by means of automatic measurement functions. Some scopes also have the ability to filter acquired signals, and a low-pass filter can be used to view an analog representation of a pulse width modulated signal. In the case where we want to analyze changes in the duty cycle, a feature called track analysis is very useful. Track analysis is a way of visualizing pulse width or duty cycle over time. That is, it tracks the value of a parameter. For example, here we see a pulse signal whose duty cycle is changing. By enabling a track measurement of pulse width, we can see that the pulse width is being changed or modulated in a sinusoidal manner. In addition to showing intentional modulation or changes to pulse width, Track measurements are also helpful in diagnosing or visualizing undesired or unintentional changes in pulse width over time. Let's end with a brief summary. Pulse width modulation provides voltage in the form of pulses and is commonly used for controlling the amount of power delivered to a device and or for controlling the behavior of a device. The most important parameter of a pulse width modulated signal is duty cycle. Increasing the duty cycle creates higher average voltages, and decreasing the duty cycle decreases average voltage. There are many applications of pulse width modulation, including audio and visual applications, power electronics, servo control, etc. Pulse width modulation is analyzed using oscilloscopes, either by measuring basic pulse parameters, such as duty cycle, or by using a track measurement to visualize the change in duty cycle over time. This concludes our presentation, Understanding Pulse Width Modulation. If you'd like to learn more about pulse width modulation or oscilloscope measurements, please see the links in the video description. Thanks for watching.